armor. Yes, that is what it means. You are equipped, I'm equipped. We all need to be equipped because we are really in a spiritual battle. But the good news is, is that we win. I'm Amy Schaefer, I'm here with Tom Hollis, and yes. we're ready to fight today. We're going to be fighting, you know, every person is born in a spiritual battle and for a spiritual battle. Yet so many of us feel under-equipped and even losing the battles we should be winning. Well, one of our favorites, James Gall, will be with us to give us some practical instruction for this spiritual battle. And Amy, I'm really looking forward to this. James has got so much insight into so many things and he's put it in his new book, The Triumph, and we'll be talking about this. There is so much in here. Oh, I so, cannot wait. And he's yeah. a great friend of Cornerstone Television. And by watching today's program, you will learn about spiritual warfare, what it is, how to combat the enemy. Plus, you'll find out how to walk in your destiny as a victorious son or daughter of God who will always lead you in triumph. That's the good news about the gospel, that he leads us in victory parades right. of triumph. That's <laughs> in the message parades. Bible. I like the parade Yeah, part. me yeah, too. Confetti, please. <laughs> and, and also, if you want to win tickets to see Amy Grant in concert on May the 14th, go to ctvn.org backslash contest to enter. Who doesn't want to go see Amy right. Grant? You know, she sang about spiritual warfare. Angels watching over me, right? Yeah. So good. And it is the National Day of Prayer as well. And so I hope you're taking part in that and seeking God for our nation. So uh, our next guest is the founder of God Encounters Ministry and is a best-selling author. And in his new book, James Gall's new book, The Triumph, he shares how we can wage war against the powers of this present darkness and walk in the victory that God desires for our lives. James, it's great to have you back with us on Hope Today. Hey, thank you so much. It's a blessing to be with you there. And I believe in hope and I believe that Jesus is the cornerstone. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there's, as I said, so much in your book that we, I think we're going to talk for like two, two weeks straight here because there is a lot of wisdom that you put in the book. I'd like to ask you, though, right off the bat, uh, it's National Day of Prayer. What do you think of things like the National Day of Prayer? I'll be participating in one of our local National Day of Prayer gatherings later today. What, what do you think the power is in those? Well, actually, it's a presidential day of prayer because it is uh, by the order of the Congress, but it was enacted uh, or initially by a presidential order. Mm -hmm. And so this all the more we must take advantage of, no matter what your affiliations might be. So if this is a call to help heal the wounds of, of, our, of our nation. And so I will be participating, just like you are, and I'll be participating in my home right here in the greater Nashville area. And I have participated for years in the National Day of Prayer. Well, let me ask you about that. And again, there's so many jumping off points in your book. Uh, what is the power in unity? It seems to be one of the things that uh, really strengthens the body of Christ. Yes, yes, it does. You know, in the book of Isaiah, it says the new wine is found in the cluster. And then in, in the Psalms, it, I think it's 133, it talks about the unity and how the oil of the Lord on Aaron, it flows down the entire body. And that's the way it is it's when we come together, not in conformity, but diversity in unity. The Lord commands a blessing. He commands a blessing. Again, it's where it is unity, not conformity, and it is celebrating our diversities brought together in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you about the book. Uh, again, some, some have said that this is like your, uh, your legacy book, that uh, you know, you, uh, you've been uh, part of, of this type of ministry for so long. Uh, you, 
you crammed a lot in here, as I've said already. Yeah, why yeah. why do that? Why why put so much of so many different subjects in such a concise format? It's really a great read that way. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I actually had this book written uh, a year ahead, ahead, and then I had a dream. And in this dream, the Holy Spirit speaks to me that I needed to reformat it. So I had to go in here, find a new way of actually writing and formatting after I thought I already had it done. And so uh, it is a wide subject because my generation, our generation, we could maybe say, yeah. grew up with these teachings on spiritual warfare. Yeah. But what I have found is that this next generation, the millennial and or Gen Z, this subject of spiritual warfare is not as prevalent today. And there is the great need for us to lay groundwork in this generation. So whether it is that for us, that we get reestablished in these areas and for the ge next generations, for them to perhaps look at some of this for a first time. It is so important because we must understand these foundational truths. The subtitle to this book, it's the triumph, but it is your comprehensive guide to spiritual warfare. That's why I start all the way with the fall of Lucifer and then all the way through the cross and then us as believers then enforcing the victory of Calvary. I remember growing up in the early 90s and reading two books, Piercing the Darkness and This Present Darkness, and it was all about spiritual warfare. And it That's just right. had me so intrigued. When did you become so intrigued or fascinated with spiritual warfare? Well, again, so because of who I am and how long I've been at this, I'm actually celebrating uh, 50 years in full-time vocational ministry this year. So I dedicated this book to three people who have greatly influenced my life in this area. First of all, to Derek Prince, the teacher of teachers in the charismatic movement. And as a young man, I sat in scores of meetings with the teacher of teachers, and he taught and pioneered on things like deliverance mm -hmm. and breaking and of curses. And then I also dedicated to see Peter Wagner, and also today, and both Derek Prince and of course see Peter Wagner are in the great cloud of witnesses. But I also dedicated it to Ed Silvoso, who wrote the foreword for this book. Mm -hmm. So when did I get into this? You know what? I think I probably got into it at a very early period of time because I make a statement in this book. We are each, as believers, we are born in the middle of a spiritual warfare. But it's not only that. We are each born for this battle. And we are prepared, we are equipped, and we are ready for this. Yes, we are. Well, and if we're in a battle then, I hope we have some weapons, okay? I hope we're coming in, in there prepared. What are some weapons that you would like to highlight for us today? Hey, I think that perhaps this week or in some of your own Bible study, other programs, that in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about putting on the full armor of God. And it covers every area. And so with the head, of course, it's the helmet. But it's not just the helmet of salvation. It's actually the helmet of hope of salvation. And, of course, we take up the shield of faith. But one of the things that people need to understand, as prophetically, mean, many people talk about this period of time as the year of the door. Well, what we need to know is that when we talk about the shield of faith, it's not just the circular shield. It is actually a door. So this shield of faith is a like a size of a door. And it's when you put that shield of faith 
connected with another person because one can put a thousand to flight and two ten thousand and we put ours connected then to the next person and then it can actually as we walk together it can actually become like an army tank moving forward with the shields of faith which are able to extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one by the way everyone gets fiery darts this is new testament teaching not just old testament and it's after the cross every believer has fiery darts that are shot towards them but it's how you take up your shield of faith it says to extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one you know when you you talk in in the book about uh leading prayer for a a uh, uh an outreach that mahesh chavda was doing and uh, i guess we've had here as well um, and it reminded me of some of my outreaches uh, in my YWAM days of when we would go and worship the Lord and pray oh, prior yeah. to or during those times. Where, what is going on in the heavenlies as we're preaching the gospel, but yet people are interceding? You know, we, can, we have a preview of that in the Old Testament in mul multiple places, but in particularly in the book of Daniel where Daniel prays, he, it, the scriptures say that he is heard as soon as he prayed. But in the mid-heavens, the answer to his prayers were restrained, or they, there was a battle in the mid-heavens of his answer coming through. And so it talks about, it's like the curtain gets pulled apart, and we get to see beyond the veil, even in an Old Testament look of what is actually occurring. And so there is called forth a reinforcement of angelic activity, Michael and his angel, which is also Michael as an archangel, is called, I'm going to just push this in there right now, is called to be a defender of Israel. This is really important right now. And so... Here we have the veil is parted for us in the book of Daniel. We see in this 21-day battle that there is another angel, Michael, who comes alongside to wage war against the geopolitical spheres of angelic uh, beings. And then the answer comes forth then to Daniel. Sometimes in our lives as well, this is what's occurring. And so that's why some of you are going, why is it my prayer? Or it could be, why isn't the answer to my prayer readily coming forth? It's because there is a battle being waged in the heavenly places to the release of God's answer to your cry. That's so good. And, and let's just pick up for just a second on Daniel, who was Jewish and in exile. Let's talk about Israel right now and what's happening. All eyes are on Israel. Our college campuses are even, you know, shouting pro-Israel, anti-Israel. Um, what kind of spiritual warfare is happening in Israel and how can we as believers pray? Yeah, thank you so much because in the last days, in the end times, all eyes will increasingly be upon the apple of God's eye, which is, has been, is now, and yet will be Israel. And so um, here again we have today, I believe that we are living out Psalm 83. So if you have time, you can do a Bible study and look at Psalm 83, particularly verses 3 and 4, that there will be a conspiracy among the nations to wipe Israel off the face of the earth that she be remembered no more. Then it goes through a whole list of what I reference as geopolitical spheres or even nations. What's fascinating is that Germany is not listed there. So that this particular battle is not about during the Holocaust. Russia is not actually, Gog and Magog is not listed in that in Psalm 83. Mm -hmm. 
neither is Egypt, so it is not about the War of Independence in 1948. So I believe, and many do, that we are living right now, folks, in Bible prophecy, and we are in the middle of Psalm 83, where this regional war heightens. Now, what can we, it, and, it, and it becomes very heightened and across the face of the earth, causing nations to line up on which side, and let's get real. We have allowed in our college campuses for a different type of theology, a different kind of ism to arise, and it's humanism, and it is going into a lot of teaching on Marxism. Mm -hmm. So today we have Hamas, and I'm going to use a different word, Haman. So we are reliving, starting to, the book of Esther all over again. Now, who is going to stand up for Israel today like Esther Hadassah did in that period of time. Well, it needs to be a remnant portion of the body of Christ, and that's you and me, and we need to be alert to the times. Yeah, that is so good. You know, uh, this, uh, I hadn't planned on asking you this, but yesterday's program, we had a missionary to Egypt on the program, and it yeah. led Amy and I to talk about in Isaiah 19, where it talks about how Egypt right. and Assyria will be uh, together with Israel. Could you just speak to that? Has God showed you anything on that particular passage? Yeah, no. Actually, in another book that I have, that I have written that is a good uh, you know, companion is the mystery of Israel in the Middle East. And in it, a distinction is I talk about praying for all of the descendants of Abraham, not just the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. So I go through and I teach us about praying for the descendants of now all ears, okay, of Hagar, and also then Sarah and the descendants of Abraham and Keturah. Because when Sarah passes away, Abraham gets married a second time. He and Keturah have children and more children than what Abraham with Hagar and Abraham with, with Sarah have combined together. And there are prophecies in the word of God for all of the descendants of Abraham, of all. So why do I bring this up? So Egypt, I believe the Holy Spirit has showed me, is that there is a nationwide Holy Spirit movement that is coming for Egypt. And I believe that as Egypt was used to cover baby Jesus from persecution, so therefore there is a promise that is for Egypt today. Right here in Nashville, where I live, there is quite a growing population of people from Egypt. And a lot of them are Coptic Orthodox Christians. And they honestly... So many of them, there was one church about a decade. There are 14 Coptic Orthodox congregations right here in greater Nashville, Tennessee today. I believe there's going to be a sweeping move of the Holy Spirit yes. in Egypt, yes. and we are in the beginning stages of the prophecy of Isaiah 19 coming into being. Wow, that, that is fantastic. I love hearing that. I love seeing prophecy unfolding before our very eyes there. Let me bring it back to a, a personal level. You talk about the enemy using weapons against us. We talked about our weapons, his weapons, accusations, shame, and guilt. How do we respond to that? Yeah, again, it, I said, yeah, again, okay. But yes, <laughs> we each have the shield of faith. Now, yeah. no one else can hold that up for you. You have to take it up yourself. And then I mentioned putting on the helmet, but it is the helmet of hope, of salvation. So we need to be dressed in the breastplate of righteousness, 
One of the things I, want, I feel like accenting right now, though, it's called the belt of truth. So there can be truth, which can be doctrinal, proper doctrinal truth, but it could also be truthfulness, which integrity mm. is a missing jewel, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Yes. in the body of Christ yes. today. And this is something in truth, integrity, that must be restored. I frankly believe that we, there is a plumb, like in the book of Amos, chapter 7 through 9, there is a plumb line that is being dropped today. And so I just want to say, we have some good news. Because we are in the beginning stage of an authentic revival. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord but he who has clean hands and a pure heart? So don't get discouraged if you see a lot of disclosures happening because this is conviction and the spirit of conviction at work. And the Holy Spirit is revealing sin. And this is important because who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Those who... They've gone through a cleansing first. So, folks, we're going through a cleansing so yeah. we can go through another empowering so that we can participate in the greatest awakening that the world has ever seen. Wow. Oh, even so. Even so, let it come, Lord Jesus. I, I, you're right. It is coming. We're seeing that uh, more and more, that, that kind of revelation type of thing. But... Uh, James, again, there is so much. We could talk for weeks here. I would encourage yeah. everyone, if you want to know about spiritual warfare, get the triumph. It's, it's, it, there's so much. It's just chock full of things. Thank you so much, James, for writing it, and thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, blessings to you and to the entire Cornerstone family. I love you. You do a great job of integrity in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. God bless you. Lord, thank you so much. Well... Uh, again, a very important conversation. I really enjoyed that time with James. Well, now it's time for us to check in with Sydney and see what's coming up on this week's edition of the Glory Hour. Today, family, you know something we all do? I dream, you dream, we all dream, but is God trying to say something in our dreams? And the answer is a big yes. And I'm really excited for this week's episode of the Glory Hour because we are diving all into dreams and unlocking the supernatural dimension of dreams with DeMonte Edmonds. Here's a little taste of what he had to say. Take a listen. Sometimes when you're in an atmosphere uh, that's demonically charged or demonically infested, the dreams that you're having become less about you and more about that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so since I travel a lot and stay in a lot of different hotels and different countries that I've been into, you know, when I lay down at night, I can feel sometimes the atmosphere over that place. And my dreams will become affected by the atmosphere. I just love what he said about how dreams can even alert us about atmospheres and what is going on. You don't want to miss this episode of The Glory Hour with DeMonte Edmonds. He's a sought after prophetic leader who travels the nations and we are going to decode dream symbols, talk about how they point us to spiritual warfare and so, so much more. So be sure to join me on The Glory Hour, Cornerstone Television Network's YouTube channel and also on Spotify. We're streaming there as well. Can't wait to see you on The Glory Hour. Talking about dreams and visions and spiritual warfare and atmosphere and spheres. Let's see what Ephesians 6 verses 12 has to say about this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is what we were wrestling with. You thought you were just wrestling with your brother or your aunt or your kid. Are you kidding me? It is much more than a physical battle. And actually in the Amplifies says we are, it's, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but we're contending like we're only contending with physical opponents. This is like spiritual wickedness. This is like strongholds. But the good news is, is that we win because we are endued with power and authority that we have because of the victory Christ gave we're us. Endued. We're we endued. We're endued with, uh, <laughs> with power. Let me, let me say this, <laughs> that we don't only not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
we don't wage war according to the flesh. Though we live in the flesh, we don't wage war according to the flesh. We don't wage war like everybody else does. In other words, we're not attacking per, a person. When we say spiritual warfare, the whole warfare thing, it, it kind of upsets some people because they don't want to be you know, arguing with people. Well, that's not what it's about. It's not about arguing with people. And our world loves to argue right now. We just love to argue. Just go online sometime. There's people arguing all the time, up and down, about everything. But we don't do that. We're not the people that wage war according to the flesh. We are waging war with these spiritual things, what James was talking about, these spiritual weapons. And you know what some of these weapons are? Humility, okay? What? The devil doesn't even know what to do with humility because he doesn't understand it. So when you walk in humility, when you prefer others, when you respond in the opposite spirit, when you do these things that are, are spiritual warfare principles, you begin to see things break. Yeah. You know, I have a, a great friend who is a secular Jew and we we disagree on many things, religiously, politically, and on many factors. And anytime there's a subject or a topic that comes up that makes you feel like fiery, I just think, no, I'm not losing this relationship over my opinion. I'm not afraid to speak truth, but there is a way to do it where you are not fighting flesh and blood. There has to be a way as believers that we are salty and that we are the light and that we are not the ones so full of contention and anger and rage. That is not God's will. And, you know, I remember, you know, like I was telling James growing up, just being really fascinated with spiritual warfare. And I remember one time my dad said, Amy, there is not a devil under every rock <laughs> waiting to take you out. Jesus defeated death, hell and the grave. And that curse of sin and death and the power of the enemy is broken over our lives. And I thought, you know what? You're right, Dad. Like there's an awareness that there is a spiritual battle going on. There is spiritual warfare going on. But we're not fighting from a place of defeat. We're fighting from a place of victory because the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwells and lives in us. So you have today power and authority over every spiritual wickedness and darknesses because it's Christ in you and that gives you hope today. On tomorrow's Hope Today, understand God's immeasurable kindness and divine goodness. Pastor and author Nate Pickowitz expands our understanding of God's character and how his loving kindness and mercy are demonstrated to our world. That's tomorrow on Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.